So I want to just thank Cheryl immensely for coming out on this evening. And if you could all just join me in clapping to welcome Cheryl for her talk, Watching the Sun. Okay, good evening everyone. And uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, as Kelly says, on such a, a cold and wintry night, well, at least it's a nice, warm, dry space um, to be sitting in. And it's a lovely space here, actually, and um, uh, as Kelly didn't mention, but this is a benefit on behalf of St Ives Library. Um, I'm very keen on libraries, having uh, for 20 years been the library manager at St Just Library. Um, so I know how important they are. And, um, Thank you for um, purchasing tickets to come to this and know that all your um, um, money that you paid out for it goes towards St. Ives Library, um, which is a great thing. Okay, um, this evening I'm going to be uh, giving a talk called um, Watching the Sun, the, the Wheel of the Year. Um, and we're going to be uh, looking at how the ancestors uh, connected with the sun. Um, the talk is based on this uh, booklet called Watching the Sun. It was produced by um, uh, Caroline Kennett and myself. Uh, it consists of articles from the magazine May Mambro uh, that I've edited for the last 35 years. Um, and a, a variety of contributors uh, talk about this topic. Um, because if you're interested in um, ancient sites, and interested in the people who built the ancient sites, as I always have been, um, then uh, it's a fascinating topic because uh, I like to think of um, not just the sites themselves, but the way in which those sites were constructed and used. And we're talking about the uh, Neolithic and the Bronze Age periods primarily, but we also talk a little about the Iron Age. And the people that, that built those sites at that time, um, we can never know for certain uh, exactly why they did it. They left no written records for us, so we have to infer it. We can infer it partly by legend, and I'll be talking about some folklore and legend in the course of the talk. Um, and also in the ways in which they constructed the monuments, um, and we'll be looking at that. The, the talk is chosen deliberately um, on this winter evening because we're just a, a week away from the winter solstice. Uh, and that was a key time in the wheel of the year for our ancestors that built the ancient sites. And the winter sol solstice is the uh, shortest day and the longest night of the year. And I'm going to argue for the next um, hour or so that our ancestors knew exactly what they were doing. Um, they understood the passage of the sun uh, around the earth at that time. Um, and they built their monuments to mark those points in that wheel of the year. And what I want to do is to emphasize that this is not simply a scientific or a mechanical thing that they did, um, but it was part of their whole belief system. It was important to them because they saw the sun, probably, as, as a god or a goddess, um, and they felt themselves to be part of a whole um, uh, construction um, by a deity um, from which they drew their sustenance. They drew their livelihood, they, their very existence um, from the presence of this sun, god or goddess in their lives. So, it's not just the scientificness, if you like, of the alignments of the sites to the sun, it's also the meaning of that in terms of their uh, religion, their faith, their belief, um, the mythology of it. Um, we don't, they didn't separate it out like we tend to. Um, we look at things from a scientific perspective and we also, all of us, or some of us, have our own belief systems. For them, it was all integrated into one. So what we're looking at um, is frequently um, some of the, the alignments, which are fascinating in themselves, but remembering that this sits within the context of uh, a whole faith and belief system that they had. Um, 
and the celebration of the noting of the sites at particular points in the wind of the year was as much about um, the uh, regeneration of life, the rebirth um, through the returning of the sun, um, and the well-being of the tribe, the people, um, the, the, the cattle, their food sources, uh, their very essence of their being. Um, so it's watching the sun, not just for what the sun does at different points, but also because of what it meant to them uh, as a people. Okay, let's kick off. I'm going to start with the maths of it a bit. It's not complicated, but it's kind of good to know it. And lots of what I'm saying will be known by many of you, so forgive some repetition, but I just like to put it into context. We're at this point, we're at the winter solstice. Now we have to imagine ourselves as the centre of this wheel, there, and uh, this is the point from which we observe the sun in its passage around the year. Um, of course, as we know, um, it's not the sun that moves, it's we that move, it's planet Earth that moves around the sun. But from our perspective here on the Earth, it's the sun that moves. And the sun makes a passage of 365 and a quarter uh, days during the, um, the course of the year. Um, and uh, it covers quite a, a distance on the horizon if you're an observer and watch it. I mean, where we live is um, over at Pendine at the Los Caswell. Um, we have a view right across the horizon. Um, we can see that in the course of the year, the sun makes quite a, a passage across that horizon. It's quite a large area uh, that it covers from the winter solstice, where we are now, or just coming up to, to the, the summer solstice. It's that arc that the sun um, appears to rise and to set during the course of the year. Um, at the winter solstice, where we are, uh, it's at its southmost, southeastern point, about 135 degrees. Uh, it never rises any further south than that. Uh, between the southeast and the south, and between the northeast and the north, the sun never rises. Uh, the moon does, but the moon's a lot more complicated, and that's the <laughs> Uh, subject for another talk. Um, but for the uh, sun, uh, we see um, it, him or her, rise um, uh, at its lowest point <coughs> at the winter solstice. That's the shortest day, longest night. Um, that occurs next Wednesday. It can occur around about the 19th, 20th, 21st, sometimes 22nd uh, of the June, but generally it's thought, oh, sorry, of December. Generally, it's thought to uh, be around about the 21st. So, we see the sunrise at the winter solstice, and that was a very significant time, um, which I'll explain and illustrate in, uh, in a minute. The sun then moves, it starts to move across the horizon. From this point, this winter solstice point, its most southerly point, it starts to move in a northerly direction. And about every six weeks, there's a different point on the wheel of the year. So in six weeks' time, at the beginning of end of January, beginning of February, it reaches uh, about 112 degrees east southeast, And that was marked by the festival of Imbolc. In another six weeks, it's reached 90 degrees. And that marks the spring equinox. Another I say six weeks, approximately six weeks. Um, it will go to 77.5 degrees, and that's east northeast, and we'll have reached the festival of Beltane. Another six weeks, the sun will rise, and it will be at its summer solstice, six months uh, away from now. And that's about 45 degrees, and that's the longest day and the shortest night. At that point, it turns, or it appears to turn, and starts to make its way back again. So from the summer solstice, it moves back to east, south, northeast, um, and that denotes the Lamas or Lunasa point in the wheel. It then, which is the same as the Beltane one, but we'll come back to that in a minute. 
Um, in another six weeks, we reach the equinox again, but this is the autumn equinox. And of course, the position of the sun rising is the same at the spring and at the autumn equinox. Another six weeks, we're back to uh, about 112.5 degrees east northeast, and uh, the sun is marked by the festival of Samhain. And in about another six weeks, we're back to the winter solstice again, and we've covered a full year of uh, the sun when viewed over the horizon. The same thing happens on the setting. So, the setting on the winter solstice is southwest, and you'll notice that the arc that we see the sun rise and set um, is at its shortest at this time of the year. So it rises there and it sets there, and it's quite a small arc. From the winter solstice set, it does the same. Um, uh, so in about six weeks, it's got to in bulk, and it's setting it in the west-southwest direction. Another six weeks, and it's got to in equinox, and it's setting at the spring equinox in the westerly direction. Another six weeks, um, it gets to west-northwest, uh, and it's at Lammas, and another six weeks, it's got to the summer solstice uh, setting in the northwest. Um, that's as far uh, north as it gets. Again, just as in the rising, it then turns. I mean, solstice actually means sun stands still, which uh, is an indication of it appearing to, to, to hover in the sky um, uh, and then start moving back again. So uh, by uh, Lammas, um, it's back to west northwest. By autumn equinox, it's setting in the west again. Uh, by Samhain, it's west southwest and by the winter solstice it's back again there and you'll see that at, um, at the summer uh, it's creating the biggest arc so therefore the sun's in the sky for the longest period of time it's rising uh, in the northeast direction and it's traveling right round before it sets in the northwest direction so the summer solstice has the biggest arc the winter solstice has the smallest arc between rising and setting um, so just bear that wheel in mind as we go around, um, uh, and that's some, certainly something that the, the ancients would have known about and observed. Now, there is a distinction to be made in places on this wheel, um, which I just briefly talked about before we uh, kick off around the wheel, um, and that is that four of these um, festivals are solstice festivals, that is they are dependent directly on the sun and the monuments that the uh, ancient peoples built took that in, into account and aligned their monuments directly to where the sun was at those specific points on the wheel. So there is the summer solstice, the equinox, spring and autumn, and the winter solstice, so the, the, the solar festivals. There are four of them, and again, four setting, summer solstice, uh, equinox, spring and autumn, and winter solstice, four points uh, which are very much related to the sun and, and directly uh, focused around um, what the sun is doing at those particular times. The four, and, and those were the earliest festivals, so the earliest monuments that we have are those that um, are observing those points on that wheel uh, and are aligned to it. They date by and large from the Neolithic and early Bronze Age periods. The other four festivals we call the Cross Quarter Days, and they are Beltane and Lamas and Imolk and Salwen. And as you can see, they are the midpoints between the solar festivals each time both the rising and the setting. Um, and those festivals are different. Um, there aren't so many uh, monuments from the Neolithic and Bronze Age um, which are aligned to those festivals. Uh, and in fact, some archaeologists would argue that they weren't observed by the, the Neolithic and Bronze Age peoples at all, although there is evidence that some monuments were. Um, whether that was chance or whether that was deliberate or not, the jury's out on it. 
but they're called the pastoral festivals or the cross border days because by the time we get to the Iron Age Celtic period, they were certainly observed and they were important to the Iron Age Celtic peoples. Um, at, um, uh, for instance, the Beltane Festival, they would, uh, by this time they'd settled and were pastoralists and um, uh, they farmers and, and they'd also raise flocks of um, sheep and goats and, and cattle. And at Beltane, they would drive their cattle up to the high points uh, for the summer um, in order for them to graze there. And at Salwain, they would bring them back again. Um, and we know this from historical records that these festivals were observed at those times. Um, and other festivals of the cross quarter days, like um, uh, in Mulk, um, and um, um, uh, Lamas, uh, there was also things going on pastorally, um, and I'll come on to that as we go around the wheel of the year. But these cross-quarter days uh, are less precise in the way that the solar festivals are uh, definitely a lot more precise and were very precisely um, worked out and observed. It's, it's open as to whether the uh, cross-quarter days were observed by the, the earlier Neolithic and Bronze Age peoples, as we see as we'll go around the wheel. Okay, that's the background. Now we'll go into the festivals. We're at the winter solstice, or just coming up to the winter solstice, and what I'm going to do each time is look at sites where uh, these uh, festivals, solar festivals and cross quarters, were definitely observed. We know about this. Um, there's good scientific evidence for it. Um, and you've probably heard about these places there in Britain and in Ireland. Um, and then I'm going to turn from that to look at places in Cornwall which may have had the same um, uh, alignments, but which aren't generally so well known about, but ought to be, um, because they're really lovely. <laughs> this one I'm sure is known by everybody. We're coming up to winter solstice, and winter solstice um, is, was originally um, observed and still is at Newgrange in Ireland. Newgrange is a big um, burial chamber, burial mound, and its entrance um, was deliberately constructed to face the rising sun at the winter solstice sunrise. Um, the entrance chamber, which you can see here, um, was built with a special light box above the entrance and you can see the light box just there. Um, the whole structure uh, was built um, to celebrate the rebirth of the sun at the winter solstice. So they must have been able to observe it over many generations before they actually built the monument to determine that this was the precise day on the 21st, sometimes 22nd, as I said, other days outside, um, that the sun returned, uh, in other words, that it got to the darkest point um, leading up to it, where we are now, um, and the solstice itself um, was really important because it marked the return uh, of the sun. The days were going to get longer, it was going to get warmer, life was going to return, um, and therefore living was going to get easier. So the, the winter solstice was an important turning point and they built this huge monument in order to, to celebrate it. Um, it still works, um, and you can still go into the chamber, um, and if you're lucky enough to get a clear morning, uh, and you're lucky enough to, um, uh, to have won the Newgrange Lottery, because about 30,000 people apply every year for this, of which only a handful get chosen uh, out of the lottery. Um, then you can see the thing happen uh, to this day, some 5,000 years later. Um, now, some of you who will know something about this will probably say to me, ah, but hasn't the position of the sun changed um, uh, over those 5,000 years because of the way 
uh, that the Earth moves around the Sun um, and the precession of the equinoxes. Um, it rose in a slightly different position in the Neolithic when this chamber was built than it does today, all of which is absolutely true. Um, but in fact, it hasn't moved as much as perhaps some people think. It's only moved by um, about a degree, which is about a sun's width. Um, and because we know this, we can take this into account when looking at alignments. In the case of Newgrange, it simply means that the sunrise occurs about four minutes later um, nowadays than it did when it was built. Um, and it also rises at a, as a slightly different angle um, from the, over the horizon um, so that it enters the chamber uh, in a, at a slightly different angle and about four minutes later than it was done originally. But it still works. Um, if you go to Newgrange, I don't know if any of you have been, but um, they do reconstruct it when you're there um, so you can get an idea of um, how it would have happened and how magical it would have been. It's magical even today, um, observing it, and um, with the people who must have followed the same belief system, uh, it must have been uh, an incredible experience um, to have been in this chamber waiting for that sun to, to um, arise and be reborn and shine through the light box into the chamber and illuminate the whole of the inner chamber at the end of it. Um, so we know for certain that um, the ancient peoples um, uh, did view this at the winter solstice and, and Newgrange is a lovely example. It's not the only example, there are a number of other um, chambers there uh, and um, one of those um, chambers, one is called Nauf, um, which is aligned roughly to the spring and autumn equinoxes. The other one is Dalf, which isn't open to the public. Um, but this is a rare uh, shot um, uh, done by Anthony Roberts of Dalf at the winter solstice. Um, and it's the winter solstice sunset that shines into the entrance chamber at Dalf and illuminates the whole of the interior. So the whole area is a ritual landscape uh, whereby these three main burial chambers were each aligned to specific occurrences around the wheel of the year. And at the winter solstice, uh, it's the sunrise that they could have seen at Newgrange, and they would have been able to have walked probably by a processional pathway across the land um, uh, in time to see the same sun setting through the entrance of the neighbouring um, chamber of Dalf at the, the winter solstice um, sunset. So it's a, it's a wonderful place. Um, and they knew exactly what they were doing when they built it. You can see something of the same down here in Cornwall, though not as spectacular, I must admit. Um, but nevertheless, it's lovely that we do have something similar. Uh, I always call it a mini new grange. This is um, uh, the Barrow of Bosiliac on the West Penwith Moors. It's lost its domed um, roof, um, but it too is aligned to the winter solstice sunrise. Um, this photo by Ian Cook shows the barrow illuminated by the first rays of the rising sun at the winter solstice. Um, this is the entrance to it. Um, this is the two entrance stones. There's a blocking stone in the middle. And at the back of the chamber would have been illuminated by that rising sun um, at the winter solstice. And it's Can I just ask where about mm. is, is it near the men on top? It, it is. Yeah. Um, it's up on the um, on the ridge yeah. um, behind there, um, and you can um, follow the trail from the Menon Toll uh, across the moors through the Nine Bains and over to Basiliac. Um, you can also approach it by a road and, and walk from the other direction through Newbridge as well. So it's a great um, if you feel like uh, getting up. Next, uh, next morning and going and seeing it, and you've got a clear morning, then it's certainly something that worth seeing. Um, this photo, again by Ian, shows the actual barrel itself. 
um, with the rising sun at the winter solstice. Those are the two entrance bands. Um, that's the sun coming up. Um, and this photo by Caroline Kennett, who's with us this evening, has a, a, another beautiful one showing the rising um, solstice sun just before the solstice itself, um, but rising over the horizon uh, and shining into the entrance barrow. So clearly, you know, these people, they may have been living in different places, um, but they shared the same um, belief system, uh, mythology around the rising and setting suns at these key times in the year. So, yeah, these things can still be viewed even uh, 5,000 years later. Winter solstice, we also have a, 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 a sunset alignment here uh, in Cornwall. This is June Coit, which I'm sure will be familiar to many of you, again up on the West Penwick Moors, not far from here. Um, and the story behind this one is um, this particular alignment uh, I, I discovered by chance about 30 years ago. Um, and I went up on the moors at the winter solstice. It was a lovely day. Uh, I was standing there and watching the, the sun set. And the sun was setting towards uh, Khan Kenajak, which is a, a distinctive rocky outcrop on the horizon. You can see in the photo there, that's Khan Kenajak. Um, it's a smooth horizon with this rocky feature. Khan Kenajak is known as the Hujin Khan. Lots of mythology surrounds Khan Kenajak and that whole area. Um, and this, of course, is um, the outline of Jim Coit. And I sort of standing there and watching the sun beginning to set. And I was thinking, that sun's going to set into, into Khan Kenajak. Now, Khan Kenajak has a couple of very distinctive notches on it. And as I stood there and watched it, it sank, as you see, I had a very clear view um, directly into the notch. Um, and again, I thought, ah, oh, well, this is not a coincidence. Because at this point, June point, which is a, one of the earliest monuments to be built by the people in the, in the Neolithic, um, they built this deliberately here in order to, to view this phenomenon. If it had been 10 yards one way or 10 yards the other way, it wouldn't have sunk into the, into the notch of Khan Kenajak. So it was a deliberate act. Um, and at the time, I was helping to run the uh, Cornish Earth Mysteries group. And we decided that we would go up and watch this uh, the following year, which of course was completely cloudy. And we never saw it. <laughs> and for the next 20 years, we went up every year to try and watch the phenomenon. <laughs> and I think, I don't think once in all that time um, <laughs> did we actually get a clear evening on the winter solstice in order to see it. Um, but um, having said that, uh, um, a few days one side or the other, we did occasionally manage to get a clear day. Um, and shortly after uh, the end of that, I, I did go up again and was fortunate enough um, to see it again. This is uh, about 20 years later. Um, and got a shot of it sinking into the launch of Khan Kedidak itself. Um, Remember that in originally back in the Neolithic it would have been one sun's width um, different to that, so it would have sunk in a bit, bit later than it sinks in now. And there are two notches on Khan Kenijak, um, so it would still have gone into the notch. But it still makes a really spectacular mm -hmm. view today. So there's another thing maybe, if you fancy it, uh, one afternoon and we get a clear afternoon. And from now onwards you should be able to see it because uh, the winter solstice, as I said, means sun stands still. Um, so for a few days, about ten days, maybe five days before or five days after, uh, you're going to be able to see it. It doesn't actually have to be on the solstice itself. So over the next ten days, if anybody fancy a trip up on Kanka, uh, up to Tune Point, um, get a clear afternoon, uh, you should be able to see that uh, sun setting into the notch, which makes a really spectacular view. Okay, that's the winter solstice. Um, moving on, um, as I say, in about six weeks' time, we'll get to the end of January, beginning of February. And this is then the uh, first of our cross-quarter days. Um, and this is the cross-quarter day of Imbolg. And 
it was uh, these festivals, which were celebrated by the Celts, um, were really important. They became embedded into our, our prehistoric consciousness uh, and into more modern times. Uh, a lot of them became uh, Christianized and, and under a Christian country, um, so that our winter solstice, of course, became Christmas. Um, and then the next one, uh, in bulk, became the Christian festival of Candlemas, which was celebrated with um, a, a lot of lights um, and was a festival dedicated to St. Bridget. Now, St. Bridget is a very important Catholic um, Christian saint, um, and uh, she uh, originally, um, it's thought, was probably celebrated as a a pagan Celtic goddess, um, Bridget or Breed or Bride. Um, and there are many sites, particularly through Ireland and Scotland, which were dedicated to her. Um, so this festival um, was subsequently taken over as, as Candlemas and is still celebrated. Um, and of course, those who celebrate the pre-Christian festival of the Wheel of the Year uh, know it as Imbolc. Imbolc means uh, in the belly, and um, probably refers to um, sheep um, lactating um, or giving birth to the, um, the, uh, the ewes, um, which happens around this time. Uh, because it was dedicated to Bridget, it's often associated with holy wells, um, because many Bridget sites were. Um, this is the beautiful holy well from Aria in West Cornwall, um, which many people do go uh, to at Imbolc. Um, to celebrate the festival. Um, this is uh, in Mulk, um with the candles uh, floating in the water of the well, uh, actually at Imbolc. Um It was a very important festival. Um, there was records kept um, in both in Scotland and in Ireland uh, by people who travelled around uh, collecting um, legend and folklore and myth. Uh, in the 19th century, um, and of course in parts of Ireland, particularly in the western parts, they were all Gaelic speaking, uh, so for many years the, the festivals that they followed weren't widely known about until the Institute of Folklore went around and, and, and collected examples of what people did at these festivals. Um, and the Imbolc stuff makes fascinating reading, because throughout Ireland, particularly in, in the more remote Western Ireland and uh, in the western parts of Scotland, they all did much the same thing at Imbolc. Um, the, the children from the villages would go and collect um, uh, shells from the seashore uh, or they'd collect um, early flowers from the hedgerows um, and then they'd bring them back to the houses uh, and in each house they would make an effigy um, of a figurine, which they called the Deba Breed. Um, and this uh, figurine was supposed to represent um, St. Bridget. Um, and they would decorate her with these flowers and with these seashells and make her look pretty. Um, and then on the night of Imbolc, uh, the head of the house would go to the door, the back door, uh, and in a uh, Gaelic invocation, which I'm not going to attempt to reproduce, um, they would call in uh, the spirit of Bridget into the effigy. So they, the, the Bridget herself would be seen to arrive and enter um, the deeper breed, uh, which is an amazing thing to happen right up as late as the 19th century. Um, and then this deeper breed was thought to be Bridget herself. They would carry her to the table which had been prepared in her honour um, and they would have um, butter and um, uh, breads and things on the table um, and she would be set up at the head of the table uh, in, uh, as the honoured guest um, and they would then take pieces of cloth which they would touch on the deeper breed and these pieces of cloth would be used um, uh, as what was called the black breed which means it was used for good luck, it was a totemistic thing um, so it was used for healing. It was used um, when women went into labour and had childbirth. 
uh, it was used if they had any hurts or injuries. Um, and the, the pieces of the black breed that, um, were thought to um, uh, be efficacious for, for healing purposes because they were infused with, with the spirit of Bridget itself. Um, I think this is amazing because the, they weren't thinking of Bridget particularly uh, as a, a saint or a religious icon. She was just Bridget to them. Uh, and she came to the houses every in bulk. Every in bulk he, Bridget returned and they honoured her and gave thanks to her um, in their ceremonies. And, and this is very late for this, this kind of um, observations to be taking place. Um, around uh, the wheel. It's not particularly a solar festival, but it is a really important festival that looks back to, to um, that period uh, of Imbolc um, uh, and the healing powers uh, of Bridget herself, um, which were um, thought to dwell in the, in the deeper greed. Um, it's an amazing thing, really. Okay, we must move around the wheel. Um, and uh, uh, next we move to the spring equinox. Uh, and again, we're back to a solar festival. And we know that it was observed um, uh, by some of the monuments that we have uh, in different places in the world, um, uh, where the entrances of the chambers were aligned to the sun uh, at the um, uh, spring equinox. And of course, at the autumn equinox, because both spring and autumn equinox uh, uh, pointing in the same direction of 90 degrees. So at Spring Equinox, this is La Hu B. Uh, it's on Jersey, for anybody who's, who's been there. It's an amazing um, burial chamber again, and its entra entrance is, is deliberately facing uh, the east um, uh, at the uh, Spring Equinox. Um, so it, uh, we were on Jersey, and um, it is in a, a a real privilege to be in places like this. Um, and you have to book in advance, but they do let people in uh, to be able to see the spring equinox at times like this. Um, there are a number of examples all over the world of these. Um, this particular one is the Dolmen de Sote, um, and this is in Andalusia, um, in Spain. Um, uh, it's a very elaborate dolmen. Um, and again, its entrance uh, faces the rising sun um, and only occurs at the, the spring equinox. Um, many places uh, like this. We were in um, Malta um, a couple of years ago and saw um, the spring equinox the sun enter the chamber um, at one of the uh, burial chambers on Malta. Um, so, the experience of seeing this um, is as moving in many ways as it would have been to the people who built these, these places. Um, and had the knowledge to actually deliberately orientate uh, the entrances um, for the phenomena of the rising sun at these particular times. So that's the uh, spring equinox one. Um, number of... Um, Entrance graves in Cornwall, bringing you back to Cornwall, uh, are also oriented towards the uh, sunrises and sunsets at different times of the year. Um, this is um, a, a, a diagrammatic um, a diagram of the uh, entrance graves, the known entrance graves um, down here in Cornwall. Entrance graves <coughs> are a peculiarity to West Cornwall, West Penwith, and the Isles of Scilly, quite a few. Uh, on the Isles of Scilly. These are the ones in West Cornwall. And as you can see, um, uh, some of them, not all, but some, um, are orientated deliberately towards the, the uh, uh, sunrises and sunsets. Um, particularly for our interest is um, uh, uh, number five, which is, of course, we were talking about the um, winter solstice sunrise um, and that's the Silly Egg Barrow um, where it's almost directly on the winter solstice sunrise. Uh, Tregosil Barrow is, is very close to it, uh, for 
on there. And the spring equinox that we were talking about, um, numbers one and two there, um, were probably directly oriented towards the uh, rising <coughs> sun at the spring equinox. Uh, <coughs> number two, uh, Toll Creek, it no longer exists, uh, but we have some early diagrams of it, uh, and we think that uh, it probably was deliberately oriented east, and um, this is Mayan Cliff, uh, and the entrance grave at Mayan Cliff, which is just there, near Senan, uh, again, faces east-west, so it was probably oriented to the rising sun uh, at the spring equinox. So, um, if you look carefully, uh, there are places in Cornwall, and I'm sure there are others yet that we haven't yet discovered and found, which um, have these these orientations. Okay, from spring equinox we move to the next cross-quarter day of Beltane. And Beltane, of course, is known as May Day. It's still celebrated as a pagan festival, May Day. Um, one that <coughs> hasn't really been Christianized at all, but it was at the beginning of, of May. And we have an interesting alignment um, at um, a couple of interesting alignments at Beltane. Um, this is a lovely picture of the Mary Maidenstone served all by um, uh, James Kitto, who's in the audience this evening. Um, <coughs> and of course it's one of the most well-known stone circles uh, in Cornwall, um, down near the Morna. Uh, many people visit it, but what most people don't realise when they do visit it, um, and this is not a solar alignment, this is an unusual stellar alignment. Um, in the corner of the field, um, I'm not sure, uh, but if you look into the corner of that field down there, <coughs> there, next to the Merry Maidens, there is a standing stone, which is Goon Reef. Um, that's Goon Reef. Um, and that standing stone was probably deliberately um, placed uh, exactly there, because if you go to Goon Reef, or if you went to Goon Reef, and look back to the Merry Maidens, and this is taken from Goon Reef, so looking back to the Merry Maidens, um, there is actually a public footpath, which must be very ancient, um, which travels from Goon Reef straight across to and up through the Merry Maidens. And it's been calculated that um, if um, prehistoric peoples uh, stood at Goon Reef and looked at the Merry Maidens um, uh, towards the end of April, each year, they would have seen the rising of the Pleiades star system. Now, the Pleiades star system is known in many cultures uh, throughout the world as having great significance. Uh, in many cultures, it's thought that it's a place from where the ancestors came or where the spirits of the dead returned after death. Um, now, we don't know for certain what the beliefs of the people were in this country, um, but it seems likely that given the fact that the Pleiades plays such a central part in many um, uh, prehistoric cultures throughout the world and has this really strong mythology associated with it, that the Pleiades would have been important also to the uh, Neolithic and Bronze Age peoples. Um, and uh, by standing at the Goon Reef standing stone and looking across to the Merry Maidens, they would have seen at the end of April the rising of the Pleiades star system. It would have returned every year at that time. Now that seems to me not a coincidence. Um, uh, they must have used that phenomena um, to tell them that Beltane was about to come. The, the time was approaching where they take their flocks up to the high ground and, and would celebrate the, the returning of the warming of the earth um, uh, and everything that's associated with the festival of Beltane, much of which has come through until the present day. So, um, I think it's an interesting one. Um, uh, and we, again, like all these, we can never be certain this is what they did, um, but I think some of the clues are in the positioning of these stones at that particular time. There is also another um, really good one in Cornwall. Um, now, the cross-quarter day festivals, I should say, um, have moved slightly uh, because the calendar has changed. Um, the, the, in the uh, 14th century, 
um, the calendar had got out of shift with the actual passage of the sun around the year, and they dropped 12 days, I think it was, from the calendar um, to put it um, right again. Um, and this obviously affects the timing of the cross-border days, because some people will say, um, we celebrate this on the 1st of the month, like the 1st of um, uh, February, the 1st of May, uh, the 1st of August, and, and the 1st of November. But others will say, well, no, the calendar's moved, uh, so we should actually be celebrating it um, uh, eight days, ten days later. Um, so you paid your money and take your choice over that one. But there is a, um, an interesting alignment in Cornwall on Bodmin Moor, um, and this uh, is a stone circle called the Stannan Stone Circle. And the Stannan Stone Circle consists of a really distinctive triangular stone, which was obviously chosen because of its shape, um, and a lovely shaped top to it. Um, and if you stand by this um, stone in the circle, Stannan, you have a wonderful view of Rail Tor, um, which is this very distinctive hillside. And it's got a notch in it, um, which I think is reflected by the notch of this triangular stone in the stone circle. And if you um, visit this site, um, round about the 8th of May, uh, you will see the sun rise uh, through that notch um, in the round tour when viewed from the standing stone circle. Now, yeah, maybe it's coincidence, but these coincidences keep mounting up, um, and you have to say, well, uh, if it's not a coincidence, then it was a deliberate placing. Um, this actually has implications for pushing back the dates of the cross-border days back into the Neolithic and Bronze Age when the stone circle was constructed. Um, so, um, I've asked anybody who lives at Bobby Moor or anybody here who wants to travel up round about the 8th of May on a clear morning if they can get me a photo of the sun rising through the notch in, uh, uh, in, in um, um, Rao Tor, I'd be very grateful. Um, it has been observed, <laughs> but um, I haven't yet got a really good photo of it. Um, but it should make a really good picture if anybody does it. Now, the, um, the folklore of Beltane, of course, has continued uh, right up until the present day, and Cornwall is particularly well known for it because, of course, there are a lot of festivals in Cornwall um, which date back how long we don't know. Um, but they are festivals associated with Beltane. Uh, festivals of renewal of energy, and um, particularly festivals associated with horses or osses. Um, this one is, if you're familiar to many of you, uh, it's the Padstow Obios Festival. Um, I love the Obios Festival. I think I've been every year, except for the pandemic years, um, and it didn't take place, but I've been every year for about 35 years um, without missing one of them. Um, it's an amazing festival of light and life from the rebirth of energy and the off dancing through the streets and with the teaser. Uh, it's a fantastic experience. A little nearer home, of course, is the Helston Floral uh, Day, which takes uh, place usually on the 8th of um, May, um, which again celebrates much the same thing with the rebirth of light and life um, and the energy of the um, dancing. So from Beltane, how are we doing? Oh, yeah. We're moving round to the opposite time to this year, this time of year, and that is the summer solstice. Um, and of course the most well-known um, summer solstice um, sunrise alignment is the famous one at Stonehenge that thousands of people go to visit every year. Particularly good picture, not mine, I hear some bad, but um, showing the uh, summer solstice sun rising over the heel stone um, at Stonehenge, which everybody goes to see. Um, and again, you know, you might say, ah, uh, sun's moved to sun's width since this was built. Uh, how come it, um, you know, it wouldn't have risen over the heel stone um, 5,000 years ago when it was built? Well, archaeologists have discovered that, in fact, although the heel stone is the only remaining stone there now, there were originally two stones and the other one's gone miss missing since. Um, so, in the time when Stonehenge was built, the sun would indeed have risen 
uh, between the, the uh, two stones. But it's still on a clear morning, makes a magnificent uh, uh, view, which is why thousands of people go to Stonehenge to, to see it. Uh, and then moving um, closer back to our way, part of the country, um, here's one from the uh, Cillies. Um, we have somebody here who lived on the Cillies for a number of years um, and would know that this is Bantz Khan. Um, and uh, Bantz Khan uh, has a recorded summer solstice sunrise uh, alignment. So the rising sun uh, at Bantz Khan um, at the summer solstice would have entered the uh, chamber here. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it, that the um, chamber is not built looking out over the sea, and you might expect a lot of the entrance graves on the cities to be built um, with the sea in mind, but very often they're not. Very often they're actually built um, with their backs to the sea. Um, and of course, when they were built, uh, the sea wasn't there, or was a lot further away. Um, uh, so, um, their purpose was not to do with the relationship to the sea, but was clearly to do um, with the rising of the sun uh, at particular times. Um, uh, and that's why the entrance faces in, in the direction that it does. Um, the summer solstice sunset in uh, Cornwall was um, marked at the Nine Maiden Stone Circle at Boskednan. Um, on again on the West Penwith Moors, and uh, there outside the stone circle um, is a cut down standing stone, um, the outlier to the stone circle. Uh, this is one of Ian Cook's photos, and uh, it uh, shows a view from the stone circle um, to the cut down men here, uh, that's kind of over in the background, um, at the summer solstice sunset, and the sun sets. Um, over the outlier, which was obviously deliberately placed um, where it was placed so that people could see uh, the sun setting at that particular time of the year. Um, these things are often still being discovered, and this is a, another summer solstice one, which was only discovered a matter of um, a couple of decades ago. Um, archaeologists were doing a survey of the Liskernic uh, complex on Bobbin Moor and um, uh, they happened to be there at the uh, sunset on the summer solstice uh, and they noticed this um, monument um, which um, was called at the time uh, a pseudo-coit but uh, general terms now are prot stones um, and they're natural um, stones but they have been deliberately um, placed where they have um, by uh, putting a stone underneath to prop them up. Uh, and as they discovered there was a viewing platform where this photo was taken from by, by Chris Tilly, who was there at the time, an archaeologist, uh, of the sun setting uh, in a notch um, of the prop stone um, taken from the, the, the viewing platform. Um, and they, they ran this through the uh, uh, computer um, and discovered that in the time that the Laskernic settlement was uh, constructed, it's got two small stone circles and various houses, um, that this um, viewing bank, this platform was deliberately made um, and that the sun would have set um, at that period, I think it was about 2600 BCE. Um, in that notch, in that prop stone. And I think it's lovely because it shows that, A, archaeologists do have open minds about astronomical alignments, um, and B, that there are still things to be discovered, um, even today. Um, I think sometimes we're just on the, on the birth of some of this um, stuff. Uh, and it's there for many of us to discover. If we're there and at the site at the right time, and we see the phenomena, just as with June and, and Carl Kennejack, um, we can find these things out for ourselves. And it's quite a revelation because you feel that like, you're watching something that's earth magic that would have been seen by the, uh, through the eyes of the Neolithic and Bronze Age people that built the sites. 
it takes you back 5,000 years, it's as though the intervening 5,000 years um, doesn't matter, and you're, you're back with the people that built the sites and seeing it through their eyes, seeing the same earth magic that they saw. This is Boscaloon, so a circle, I'm sure you all know that, with its central stone. Um, leaning stone, it's thought perhaps the leaning stone was always leaning, um, and that's reinforced <coughs> by the fact that the, the summer solstice sunset, um, the leaning stone um, has some um, inscriptions on it, some carvings on it, which weren't known about until relatively recently. Um, Ian Cook, who discovered them, um, thought that they represented uh, axes, you can see one there and another one there, uh, two axe heads, and of course axes were really important um, for trading um, by the Neolithic and Bronze Age peoples. Uh, recently, um, uh, psychogrammetry has been done on the stone, which involves taking lots of 3D photographs, um, and it's been suggested by Tom Goska, who did the psychogrammetry, that, uh, in fact, these are, are feet, not axe heads, because similar carvings of feet have been found on a site in, in Brittany. Um, so the jury's a bit out on it. It could be axe heads, it could be feet, but they're definitely there. Um, and the time when they're most visible, most of you go to it and you can't see them, but the time when they're most visible, um, and I'll go back to this, because I've been there and I have seen it, um, is at the summer solstice sunrise. At the summer solstice, the sun comes up over the horizon and shines onto the bottom of this leaning stone. Um, and as it does so, it illuminates the, the accents of the, of the peak carving. Um, coincidence? No, I don't think so. Um, it's just on that one morning of the year um, and it's just in the exact place um, where the first rising rays of the sun shine on the, uh, shine on the stone. Uh, again, and I say, it, it, I just watched it with open mouth astonishment, really. Um, it gave me a shiver up my back because you think, oh wow, you know, you're there in the darkness and then suddenly the first faint line, light of the sun begins to shine um, and it shines straight on for that. That, that stone and illuminates those carvings and you think, yeah, they, they knew what they were doing, the great star peoples. Um, and of course a lot again of the legends of this particular festival have gone into our, our current folklore. Um, at the summer solstice um, you can go to holy hilltops in Cornwall, right up at um, where they light uh, bonfires. Um, and other sites throughout Cornwall, um, uh, which is a memory of obviously original festivals that celebrated the sun at this time of the summer solstice, um, the uh, longest day, shortest night, and the um, power of the returning of the, of the sun before it begins to turn again down into winter. And of course there are festivals um, such as um, the Gullowin Festival down here in West Penwith, um, and where uh, Os comes out, dances through the streets, led by a teaser, um, similar in many ways to Pasto's Obios uh, at Beltane. Um, and although these are revived festivals, I think they contain within their uh, essence a lot of the memory um, of the original meaning uh, of the festival. From summer solstice, we move forward another six weeks to the beginning of August, uh, and this is the festival of Lamas or Lunasa. And the Lunasa festival, again, we're back into one of the cross quarter days. It's the festival of the beginning of the gathering in of the harvest, which for the um, pastoral peoples, the Celtic Iron Age peoples, would have been a very significant time. Um, and it was here at this festival of Lunasa that the uh, earth goddess herself, uh, the giver of all nourishment, um, was honoured in prehistoric times. Um, we know that there was a goddess celebrated at this time. Uh, the festival is called 
in Christian terms, Lamas, but in um, pre-Christian times, it's called Lunasa. And Lunasa means the festival of the god Lu. And it's often thought that this is um, Lu's festival. Well, actually it's not. Um, because the festival was set up originally in Ireland um, by Lu's, in mythology, Lu's um, foster mother, uh, who was called Teotu. And it's Teotu's festival, and it's Teotu that was celebrated in Ireland. And Lu, as her dutiful foster son, set the festival up in honour of her. Um, and the mythology of <coughs> Teotu is that she used to dwell in the high hills um, and she came down from the high hills to bring the gift of agriculture to humans. Um, and this seems to me memory of a very old um, festival um, that was celebrated at this time because if, if it's an honour of a goddess who lived in the high hills and came to give agriculture to the people, then it's a festival dating back to the Neolithic when the peoples settled in the land. They formally to that they were hunter-gatherer foragers, um, and then the the huge revolution uh, of the discovery of farming, uh, which started in the Fertile Crescent uh, of the Middle East, spread throughout Europe, spread into Britain and Ireland, um, and this was such a major thing because people could then settle um, and uh, cultivate fields and crops um, and learned gifts like the making of bread, which was the nourishment for the tribe. Now, it seems to me that the legend of this goes back to that time, because it's the gift of agriculture, it's the <coughs> gift of understanding of bread making um, that the people received from the, uh, the goddess, uh, Teotu. So it's a festival for honouring um, uh, the, the goddess of the land, and um, uh, this is part of a pagan group who celebrated it by making a, an earth mother, a green goddess uh, figurine, um, which um, was then um, placed uh, into a, a sacred site in West Penrith at uh, Bosprenis. Uh, and in the Bosprenis beehive hut, there's a niche uh, inside the beehive hut, and uh, into that they place the um, they place the grain goddess, which uh, you can see in the niche there. So, a very ancient festival, again, cross call today, again, going back probably to the Celtic, um, Neolithic, um, and possibly Neolithic times before that. Um, it is, of course, um, the same festival um, as uh, a Beltane, because um, remembering that wheel of the year at the beginning and the sun moving across and back again. So the festival of Lunasa occurs at the same time as the festival of, of Beltane. And again it's remembered into present day um, and was revived by the Old Cornwall Society um, in the early years of the 20th century with the Crying the Neck Festival. And uh, the Crying the Neck still takes place every year and a farmer will go out and collect the last grain of corn um, and in a ritual um, lift the corn um, and will um, have an invocation to which people will cry. Um, and it's a memory of the, of the same festival as making the grain, grain mother. It's honouring the earth or honouring um, uh, everything that the grain mother uh, gives us. We're nearly there. We're moving on another six weeks to the autumn equinox. And again, this is a fascinating um, festival um, because this is a solar one again. And remember, the solar ones are very precise and very accurate. Um, and the autumn equinox, which again is the same as the spring, spring equinox, um, but this time is occurring in September, on September 21st, um, was also observed by the um, uh, Neolithic and Bronze Age people. Uh, in Ireland, there's a whole complex of uh, entrance graves and chambers and burial chambers um, on at, uh, the hills at Loch Crew. Uh, there are two hills, Carnbane East and Carnbane West, um, and there's a, a, a plethora 
uh, of, of these um, entrance graves uh, on these two hills. Um, New Grange, as we said earlier, is very well known about and everybody goes there. Not many people know about Rock Crew, um, but I was privileged many, many years ago to be there at the time of the autumn equinox. Um, and I knew that there was an autumn equinox alignment to this cairn, cairn T, on Lock Crew. Um, and it was a really misty morning um, uh, on the equinox itself. And we woke up and thought, ah, oh, we're not going to see a thing, there's no point in going. Nearly turned over and went back to sleep. So glad I didn't. We decided we'll go there anyway, because perhaps the sun will clear later on in the day. We got to Lock Crew, <coughs> thick mist everywhere, <coughs> parked the car, walked up to the can, can T, still thick mist everywhere, but what the heck are we doing here? But when we got to the can T, it was completely clear, and we could see all the mist swirling down in the, in the valley below, and we had an absolutely clear morning um, to see the uh, autumn equinox sunrise. Now at this can, can T, uh, on the autumn equinox, the sun enters the chamber and shines through to the stone at the back of the chamber. And on that stone, as you can see, there are a number of symbols which have been interpreted as, as sun symbols. Um, uh, they're highlighted in, in this picture. And uh, the sun, when it enters, it's a similar effect to that as at Newgrange at the winter solstice. The sun enters, um, again, it's such a magical experience. Um, and when it first enters, it enters up in this top left-hand corner, and it gradually makes its way across, getting bigger all the time, across the stone, illuminating each of the symbols in turn, um, and until it gets to the final symbol in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, it's like some of you who are my age will remember old television sets whereby when you turn them on, you just put a little flash of light right at the end and you turn them on. And it's exactly the same. Um, you get the last flash of light onto that last possibly sun symbol and then it switches off. Um, and it's in darkness again. Uh, amazing experience. I'm, I'm, privileged to have seen it because you can't see it any longer because they, it's now been all roped off um, and the Irish um, archaeological authorities say it's unsafe so there's no entrance to it. Um, but um, we, we used to run, uh, run tours of ancient sites um, with my partner <coughs> and we went to this particular site and we took a group of women in there and had it undisturbed and we were able to sing the chant actually in, in the chamber itself. Um, but it's amazing, again, it, 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 it's awesome um, experience because you're, you're in there and you can actually watch this mm. earth magic with the sun happening um, 5,000 years after it was built. Um, and, you know, my point about things still being discovered, um, this is uh, Kangalva, the bridge of Kangalva. And uh, my friend Caroline Kennett, who's an archaeoastronomer, um, has discovered an uh, autumn equinox sunset alignment up on Kangalva uh, through this prop stem. Uh, this is her photograph, which you can still see today. So, yeah, I'd encourage you to get out there and <laughs> go to these places because there are still, still things to be discovered um, even yeah. after all this time has elapsed. Um, we're now into Salwain, which again is the cross court today. Um, it's now known uh, as Halloween in popular culture. It's at the end of um, October, uh, last day of October, beginning of November. It's been Christianised into All Souls Day or All Saints Day. Um, but uh, even though it's a cross quarter um, day, uh, there is still some evidence that it was used and observed by prehistoric peoples. Um, <coughs> this mound is the Mound of the Hostages, uh, and it's on Tara Hill in Ireland. Um, and this a Mound of the Hostages has an entrance um, which is aligned to the rising sun um, <coughs> on uh, Sawain. Um, and this photograph shows um, the entrance with the sun shining in 
uh, to the mound uh, of the hostages. Um, so, you know, there are hints that these cross-border days were actually observed by the prehistoric peoples um, from this earlier period. Um, there's another site in Ireland that also has a autumn equinox um, and by implication spring equinox as well um, alignment and that is uh, uh, Mrs. Caramore in South um, Southwest Ireland um, and this is a reconstructed dolmen but the, very similar to the dolmen that was there originally um, and this uh, dolmen uh, faces the rising of the sun uh, at Salwain um, and Salwain Halloween is um, often dedicated in um, uh, pre-Christian times to the uh, ancient goddess, the crone goddess, uh, called the Kayak uh, or Keridwen in, in Wales, but generally known as the Kayak, uh, the old one. Um, and it's interesting that neighbouring hills um, to this um, were known to be the places where the Kayak dwelt or lived. Um, and again, it's it's oriented to the rising sun uh, at that time. So very often with these things, we have to look not only at the sites themselves and their orientation, um, but also the mythology uh, attached to the sites, um, because that's very revealing in terms of what become associated with that particular site. And this site being um, associated with the kayak um, is, is of great significance, I think. Um, it's a, a shot of the uh, rising sun at Salwain shining into uh, Listergill, it's called, into the um, dolmen at Listergill, actually at Salwain. Um, so uh, you can see, even to this day, um, that that took place. Um, and this is another nice photo, not mine, but um, of a, a rainbow over the entrance um, to the, the dolmen. At Lister Gill. So, yeah, fascinating possibilities. Um, and uh, we do have one down here in West Penwith. This is back to um, Boscanu. And this is the centre stone. And if you stand on the opposite to the centre stone in the circle at Boscanu, um, at Selway, you can see the sunset um, over the court stone, which is a distinctive. Uh, stone in the circle, and the sun's just setting behind the court stone uh, there at that time. Um, you know, we don't have written records of any of this, so it's all a matter of observation. Uh, you know, this one, for instance, I happened to be there at that time, at the right time, uh, and so, oh gosh, look, that sun setting over the, the court stone. And when you do see it, it's, it's like, it's so magical um, uh, to feel that you're watching something that that the people that built the site 5,000 years ago would have seen. So that's it, we've been round the wheel. Uh, we've finished at Salwain. We'll be back again to the winter solstice, which is where we are now. Um, and this is a nice picture by Tim Pearson of uh, the rising sign at Lamion Point in, in West Penn West. Um, a, a brief canter um, round the wheel. Um, I hope you gain something from it, at least been some lovely pictures, uh, not all of mine, um, and you know I'd just like to finish by by thanking you for your interest in this, um, and urging you to really get out there and visit these sites. And if you do discover anything, let me know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, Questions, if anybody's got any? I just yeah. wanted to know where you'll be on the winter solstice this year. Yeah. <laughs> At home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I still like finding things and seeing things, but I'm getting a bit ancient now. I'm going to be trundling around over the, the hills and uh, things, but we'll be celebrating the winter solstice with some friends. Um, with our own uh, uh, ceremony at uh, home. Um, where will you be? <laughs> oh, we, we do the same. We tend to go up to the Menant Hall. Mm -hmm. We keep fire up to all of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
<laughs> See, the men and Tom may have interesting alignments as well, but I won't prolong that. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there a simple explanation as to why the midsummer and winter festivals are three days after the solstice? The Christianization of yeah. the festivals are, um, yes, of course you're right, um, winter solstice being 21st, 22nd of December, mm. Christmas Day being the 25th, yeah. summer solstice um, uh, being again the 21st, 20th, 21st, uh, and St John's Eve um, uh, being uh, later 24th, well, we often nowadays celebrate the nearest Saturday. I think uh, to it, but um, the Midsummer's Day uh, is the, 20, the eve of the 24th, 23rd, 24th, and it's where they have the fire festival on Tapuka and Bray. Um, I, I think it's, it's just that the when they became Christianized, they didn't want to be seen to be doing pagan okay. festivals, right. mm -hmm. so they, they picked something that was close okay. in there, um, for it to be, but for it to be seen, on top. yes, right, <laughs> to be seen not as actually celebrating, still celebrating a pagan oh, festival. Okay. That that would be my guess. Okay. But Just other, curiosity I have. Yeah. Other people might have other ideas. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Any others? Yeah. Do you love when you give your lectures or you know, you your Earth mysteries? Do you like the mystery? Would you like to stand up here in front of us and tell us this is what happened? I, I'm always interested in um, the people behind the science. Um, now, it's of course great interest um, in the period when nothing was written down because it's mysteries and it's open season, you know, we can make our own interpretations and I'm not saying that mine is always exactly right, you know, other people will have perfectly valid other alternatives to it. Um, the, the period when things get written down is useful because from that you can infer other corroboratory uh, information. Um, so there's a lot of the things like I was saying around some of the folklore that has continued is really interesting because um, they've gone and found out what the people actually did think and believe um, at times like in bulk, you know. Um, uh, because uh, it was recorded much later. Now things change over years. You can't necessarily expect 5,000 years, everything's going to stay the same. Um, it could change, adapt, alter. So we can't be absolutely certain. Um, but for me, it's, it, it's an interesting question. For me, it's a combination of the mystery and trying to interpret that mystery, but I'm not averse to um, actual um, definite facts. Um, if they're recorded, because it helps us to gain an insight in, into why these places we use. Um, and, you know, you can dismiss it all and say, oh, it's all, a, it's all lovely, but it's all a great coincidence. Um, but I don't think it is. I think there's just too much evidence out there. Um, and uh, for me, what's exciting is we're still finding answers to things. So I love the mysteries, but I like the answers. <laughs> well, I've I got, I got two more actually. That's all right. I'm not be greedy. You mentioned sunset and sunrise alignments. Is there a difference between them? In, in what way? What? Well, some, some, some of the alignments align to the sunset, some mm. to the sunrise. Yeah, right, yeah, I see what you mean. Um, I think both were important. Um, I think, though, that you know, when we looked at the Newgrange complex, there's Newgrange aligned to the sunrise at the winter solstice. There's Delph aligned to the sunset on the same day. There's Nauf, which is the third of the great monuments, aligned probably to uh, some kind of equinox um, alignment because they've got two chambers facing roughly east-west. Um, so they were certainly all important, but I think that they were important for different reasons. So, for instance, at the winter solstice, when you look at it, we discovered far more sunrise alignments, because clearly 
the return of the sun was important at this time of the year. It brought new life, new growth, um, uh, and, and seeing the sun come back, in a sense, um, uh, from its lowest point and its darkest point, they knew that the return of the sun meant days were going to get longer, it was going to get warmer, um, life was going to return. Uh, and therefore, the rebirth of the sun, I think, was important. And therefore, the sunrise was probably more important. And we have more sunrise alignments at the winter solstice. Um, but we also have some sunset ones. And my feeling is that um, the people were not static. Sometimes we mm. see these places and think, it's like a, a snapshot, a photograph of the past. But for the people that built them, I think they were dynamic rather than static. In other words, I think they moved across the land by sacred pathways, by processional routes. Um, and as they moved across the land, they probably told stories um, uh, or sang songs um, about the meaning of these places and the mythology behind the meaning. Um, and uh, therefore, um, some people have suggested um, that at certain times, um, they would actually encompass both the sunrises and the sunsets. So they would be at a site to see the sunrise, but they would move across the land during the course of the day, perhaps telling stories and, and, and the myths, uh, to reach in time another site that had been set up in order to see the sunset. So the whole thing was part of a, a ritual cycle that they undertook. And, and there are some people I'm looking at you, Caroline, uh, that are attempting to um, uh, perhaps recreate that today. Uh, are you not? Solstice. Yeah, at the winter solstice. Yeah. Because you, you would start over at the Mourner to see the sunrise over the Merry Maidens. And you have done this, I know, yeah. once, and walked across the land during the course oh, of the day. Tregosil. So you get to Traeger Sealstone Circle um, in order to see the sunset over the, the cities. Um, and I think this is a, an amazing thing to do. Um, and I think, guessing again, but my feeling is that this creates, recreates something of the way in which these sites were used in the past. So it's possibly not just the sunrise or the sunset. It's, it's both, and it's part of a whole ritual experience. Same as at, at uh, Newgrange, they would see the sunrise at Newgrange coming in the light box, illuminate the passage, would have perhaps moved in a ritual cycle throughout the day uh, around the whole area and finished at Dalf in order to see the sunset. And that would have completed the whole ceremonial experience of their connection with the sun at that particular time of the year. Oh, well, well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll stop. <laughs> right, um, good questions. <laughs> but the, the very first slide you showed was your, your mathematical one. Yeah. Of, yeah, of, yeah. So that knowledge, was that individual local <laughs> tribes, shaman observers observing the sun, or was that knowledge spread slowly through the ancient world? I think it was part of their belief system. Um, I think this happens in so many places that we have to assume that there was a similar belief system um, that most people adhered to during that period. Now, they may have expressed it in slightly different ways, um, but they probably all had uh, a similar belief system. And they were looking at the sun, of course. Uh, it was built around the sun because it was such a central part of their lives. Um, and I think it's quite possible that people would have moved and spread their knowledge. I mean, one of the most interesting things I'm finding at the moment is, is the new genetic um, research, the DNA evidence, because they're discovering from this for the first time that they can tell where the remains of people um, that were buried at or near these sites came from. And we know that they were very often um, people that were buried with a great deal of respect um, uh, didn't actually come from the tribe itself. They came from other places. Um, I'm thinking of the Amesbury Archer and um, uh, burials like that, where they extracted DNA evidence to show that the people who were buried uh, came from uh, way over in the, in, in the continental Europe. Um, now, 
this may be a later thing in that perhaps they came and, and brought the knowledge of bronze making for instance we know there was a big beaker invasion um, in the early bronze age um, and a lot of that may have been people coming to, to places like Cornwall for the tin in order to make the bronze and bringing with them the knowledge of, of bronze which incidentally must have been symbolically um, felt really important in terms of sun worship because the making of, of bronze objects uh, must have seemed to them almost magical uh, and like like the appearance of the sun um, because of the appearance of the bronze. So these bronze makers who had the knowledge were revered and we know were given special burials. Um, so it's a mistake to think that these little tribes all existing in total isolation. I think there was quite a lot of communication, um, very often by water, um, were people bringing the knowledge um, from one place to another. And as they brought the knowledge, they probably brought their belief systems and they influenced each other. I mean, look at stone circles in, in Britain and Ireland. Uh, they're all, di there's about 900 of them, and they're all different, all small clusters. Um, the, co the original concept of the stone circle was important, but how it was interpreted by each group of people in different places was different. Um, so the knowledge of stone circles and what they represented was, was a common knowledge throughout the whole of the uh, Neolithic, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age period, but the way people interpreted it was different in their own areas. Same with all of this. The knowledge, the belief that the sun was the centre of, of their worlds and was probably personified as a goddess or a god um, was central to their belief um, systems um, but the way they interpreted it for each of the different monuments was different um, because different people said okay we'll, we'll build this one with a passage we'll build this one with a light box uh, we'll build this one um, in a position um, where it works um, it was interpreted in, in different ways, with different monuments. I don't know if that answers the question, but it does. Thank you for the question. <laughs> we done? <Yeah. laughs>